Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be talking about the cell membrane, specifically the phospholipid bilayer, but we'll talk about a few other things. So today's topic is only the cell membrane. The learning objectives for today, what is diffusion? What does that actually mean? Uh, and what are the unique features for the cell membrane? Why it must have um, things called proteins? And what different roles do the membrane proteins serve in the cell membrane? So let's go over simple diffusion first. There's a nice diagram of it in page 184 of your textbook. Basically, simple diffusion is just the movement of substances from regions of higher concentrations to lower concentrations. Now, usually we're talking liquids, uh, but it does apply to other things, like gases as well. But it's always going from high concentration to low concentration. Now, when this happens with water across a membrane, that has a very specific name. We call that osmosis. You can see that here. But uh, as I said, diffusion can also apply to things like gases. So this applies to oxygen and carbon dioxide too. Now, in the diagram down below, you can see we have in this first one over here on the left, number one, you have A and B sides, and they're separated by a permeable membrane, means things can pass through it. And you have lots of red over here, and then lots of... Uh, I guess that's the water molecule according to the key. So the red is the solute up there. And so uh, naturally you might suspect, assuming the substance can go through the membrane, that yeah, the red's going to diffuse across this way, as you can see this little error here. But what's not also apparent is the fact that the water is actually diffusing the other way too, because the water is trying to equalize itself out as well. And so after some time, you would eventually reach an equilibrium where both sides are essentially at this point in number three equal. So that's um, an example of diffusion for the solute molecule. So that's diffusion, just basic diffusion. And for the water molecule, that's actually osmosis because it's water. Again, osmosis is just diffusion of water. Here and here. Now, how this ends up applying to the cell is because the cell is made up of a semi-permeable membrane, which we call the cell membrane, and the key components is the phospholipid bilayer. Now, we've actually talked a little bit about phospholipids before, but here are some nice general pictures. This is actually a microscopic electroimage of a um, cell membrane. You can see the inside of the cell here, and then the outside of the cell here. And again, you can see um, they show you the uh, phospholipids individually there. Now, we've talked about phospholipids before in the chemistry unit. We were talking about examples for lipids. And remember we said a lipid is anything that has this glycerol molecule and one, two, and usually three fatty acid chains. Sometimes they're saturated or unsaturated. But what makes phospholipid phospholipids, excuse me, different is that third fatty acid chain is not there. Instead, you have this phosphate head group that actually has a charge on it. So there's the charges. Uh, the oxygen has a negative charge and the nitrogen ends up having a positive charge. But what this means is that the, t the head of the phospholipid is hydrophilic, while the tails, the two tails, whether they're saturated or not, are hydrophobic. So again, here's just a different version of a phospholipid. Again, the glycerol is here. You have the phospholipid head here, and then the two fatty acid tails here. This one's saturated. This one's unsaturated. The tails are hydrophobic. The heads are hydrophilic, thanks to the charge from the nitrogen and the oxygen on them. Um, again, I've showed you this in the chemistry unit. The hydrophilic heads means that they like to interact with water because they do have little charges on them. Remember, water is a slightly polar molecule, and the hydrophobic tails have no charges, so they don't like to interact with water. That's why they tend to face towards each other when they're put into water. So you can see that right here and here as well. So as I said, um, water itself is a slightly charged molecule. We've seen that in the chemistry units. Um, and if you put a whole bunch of phospholipids together, they will actually naturally form a little capsule with this uh, bilayer surrounding the outside. They will naturally do that based upon just the charges. So 
these charges on the uh, phosphate group, specifically in the nitrogen and the oxygen, make them hydrophilic, meaning they like water. The tails have no charge, so they hate water. They don't like inter they don't like um, interacting with water. They're hydrophobic, and so they'll only interact with other nonpolar things like lipids, cholesterol, and other um, um, nonpolar items like um, other t other fatty acid chains. So I like this diagram. If you're going to get one diagram copied down into your notes, I strongly recommend it's this diagram with all these labels here. Now, the phospholipid bilayer is not the entire part of the cell membrane, but it is the key um, connecting piece for the whole thing. It's, it's the canvas upon which everything else is based, we, um, and is a key part of what we call the fluid mosaic model. So let me go into that a little bit. Now, this is a picture of the cell membrane. It's a good picture, but the problem with pictures is that they're static. They don't move. In reality, cell membranes tend to move a little bit, especially in animal cells that don't have cell walls. Um, and we call it a fluid mosaic model. So the best way to think of this in your mind is to think of like a waterbed. If you've ever been on a waterbed, you know the waterbed kind of goes up and down. It doesn't break per se, but it changes. It's never really quite the same. You can think of the surface of the ocean as kind of a, a similar analogy. So the fluid mosaic model is generally how the cell membrane is thought of. It's flexible, but not um, too flexible. It helps the cell keep its shape, but it doesn't flex so much that it's going to crush everything inside the cell. At the same time, it's not so rigid that the cell can't move a little bit. So the other big function for the cell membrane um, and besides just keeping the cell's shape, which we'll go into a little bit more in a bit, is controlling what goes into and out of the cell. So obviously the cell wants to get stuff like food and oxygen inside, and then it wants to keep things like viruses outside, and then it also wants to get rid of uh, waste products that it produces from consuming food. Uh, there's a few other things in this picture. Right here, there's a cholesterol group that helps to stabilize the cell membrane, keeps it from becoming too rigid or too flexible, so it keeps the phospholipids kind of separated a little bit. So the cell membrane is selectively permeable, or it has selective permeability is another way of saying that, which means it controls what can go in and come out, what stays outside, what stays inside of the cell. Now, small nonpolar items gases specifically like carbon dioxide and oxygen can pass in and out no problem a few slightly larger items that are hydrophobic can pass in like benzene some smaller polar uh, molecules they have to come in through very very special channels um, see that if you watch the ancillary uh, video that I also put into the playlist you'll see a gentleman talking about how water gets in but many times large polar molecules like glucose here that's just sugar or amino acids they can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer by themselves also things with really strong charges like full ionic charges cannot pass through the nonpolar region remember this is the nonpolar region here simply doesn't let them go by so some things can cross in freely or out freely like the gases some things are never allowed to cross and you wouldn't want to let them cross like viruses or certain types of bacteria and some things actually need to be inside so they actually have to get help to cross the cell membrane so back to this picture you can see in this picture there are these little blobs here 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 most of these are proteins and <clears throat> excuse me a lot of these proteins they'll sit in the bilayer and some sit completely across some sit just at the edge of one side or sometimes they'll sit at the edge of the other side but a lot of times the ones that sit completely across will actually help um, bigger molecules cross into and out of the cell membrane these are called transport proteins now there are different types of transport proteins and they can be um, categorized or classified by whether or not they actually require the cell to um, spend energy to make them work now, certain proteins require no energy at all for them to do their job to help transport things from one side to another. That would be this guy here, 
transporter molecule from here straight across. This is again going from high concentration to low concentration. All the protein is doing now is creating a specific channel for that molecule to get across, whatever it is. That's called passive transport because it follows the concentration gradient from high to low and requires no energy from the cell in order to work. There are also carrier proteins. The best um, conceptual way, and I'll have a picture I think in the next slide, but the best conceptual way to think of carrier proteins is if you've ever seen an old picture of a water wheel. It kind of works like that, where the water wheel still goes from high to low, um, but it actually has a slight movement to the way it proceeds. Again, there's no energy required in this, so that's also considered a passive transport system. This over here would just be the simple tra um, passive transport we saw with the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in the last slide. And then there's also these proteins that work like pumps. Now, if you know anything about pumps, you know that generally they're trying to push stuff against the way they naturally want to flow. So these pump proteins actually will take a molecule and go from low concentration to high concentration. And they're able to do that because the cell has to spend energy in order to make them work. And you can see that here. The cell is spending ATP. We've talked about ATP before. Remember, that is the currency of the cell. If you want to get work done, you have to spend ATP inside of a cell. And because you're spending energy and working against the concentration gradient, this is defined as an active transport system. So in this picture, you have kind of the same thing. You see simple diffusion across the membrane. That's passive, like I said before. Here are some channel proteins. Again, they're just going from high concentration to low concentration, sometimes called facilitated diffusion. And then here is active transport. Again, remember active, just think active, needs ATP. It means you have to spend energy because you're going from low to high. You're going against the way the particle actually wants to flow. It wants to be in balance. So because you're going against that and spending energy, that's active transport. And um, sometimes transport systems can be uh, one directional only for one specific type of molecule. They call this a uniport. Sometimes they can be codependent on other molecules. So this is called symport. And sometimes they are dependent on other molecules going the opposite way. This is called an antiport. Um, both of these are titled, called co-transportation proteins. So sometimes they go the same way and sometimes they can actually go across or opposite one another. Uh, once again, just re-emphasizing this, again, you can see facilitated diffusion from high to low. Same here, again, from high to low. This is a gated protein channel. Um, this last one, it can actually go in, but the protein actually has to change. You can see here, it changes shape to let it cross. Sometimes that requires energy, sometimes that doesn't, depends on the specific protein. Uh, in this case, because they're calling it facilitated transport, this one should not require energy. They don't show any ATP in this. And again, there's lots of these things, guys. There's, there's proteins for just about any type of molecule that has to get into or out of the cell. Um, it's like I said, there's channels, carriers, pumps. There's receptors for your nerve cells or your muscle cells. There's enzymes that will actually start and stop other enzymes from working inside your cell, from getting a message outside your cell. So you get a message on the outside of the cell that sends a signal through the... Um, cell membrane and tells an enzyme inside your cell to stop doing something. Uh, there are self markers which actually work for cells to identify themselves to other cells so that way your immune system doesn't attack it and the other cells know that there's something there. Um, if, sometimes if cells feel that there's nothing next to them they'll just start to grow. That's a way we uh, heal things like cuts. And a lot of times they'll work as anchors. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in the very last slide. The anchors to other cells where they actually just hook together so they're in the same basic position all the time and they have the same consistent shape. Now on this slide, I have no pictures, but what I'd like you to do is if you get a chance, you can um, download this PowerPoint from the website and then once you've downloaded it, you can click on these links and under these links, there are a couple of animations. There's lots of animations for some of them, for this last one there is, but under these animations, look specifically for the sodium potassium protein, or pump protein, and under the second one, look for lipids, 
membrane transport and secondary message and go ahead and watch the animations. These are all just different types of proteins and how they interact with the cell membrane. Um, again, you can um, just download the PowerPoint and once you downloaded it, just um, start it in the slideshow mode or copy and paste the URL and you'll go directly to that site, find those labels and watch the animations. They're very quick, very short, not more than you know five seconds a piece usually. Um, remember I said that cells will sometimes anchor to each other via proteins in the cell membranes. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about this stuff on the left. I'll go into it in a minute. But here you have an example of this. These are They almost look like they've been sewn together in some cases. But these are just different ways for cells to actually stay attached to their neighbors. And sometimes they'll actually have proteins that connect. You can see this one down here. These are called gap junctions. Well, they'll let stuff flow very instantly instantaneously, I should say, from one cell to the inside of another, so it doesn't even have to go outside, especially if cells have to talk fast. It's a very, very, very quick way for cells to communicate very, very efficiently. Um, again, you don't have to know too much in, uh, in terms of the stuff here on the left. It's nice to know, but I'm not going to be testing you on it. So that's cell membranes. As, as I said before, I'm going to be putting a secondary video from another gentleman by the name of Mr. Bozeman up as well for you to watch. He does a very good job talking about cell me membranes. I suggest you watch both of ours. Take notes on both of ours. Combine them together. Um, all that stuff is valid and fair game unless I say otherwise for uh, like a quiz or a test or anything. If you have questions, let me know in class. And that's it for now.